colonists weren't free. The colonists were very free people. They had, as British subjects, the British subjects were the most free people in the world at the time. And the colonists, living 4,000 miles from their master, were the freest people. They started their own charters, their own constitutions. They had their own assemblies that were voted directly by the people. They were real, we're talking about small. Each community had its own set of governments, which is a difference between government. After the French and Indian War, which was actually the first world war, because the whole world was involved in that war, which is kind of interesting, the French lost and the British won. Well, a lot of that war, it was also called the Seven Years' War, a lot of that war was based in America and was fighting the French. And afterwards, because of the freedoms, not that they were more free, but British decide, the British Parliament decided that the colonists were not paying their fair share of taxes for fighting the war. And they said, well, look, you guys benefited from this war because we kicked the French out. And without us, you'd be under, under French slavery or whatever. So you need to kick down, which is a pretty common theme now, paying your fair share. Well, up until that time, the colonists had a very small tax, very small, and it was limited to the areas that they lived. They didn't pay a penance to Britain at all. They just paid to their local or, uh, local govern governors or whatever. And we also have to understand that they were, um, most of them were land grants, so no one, a lot of the people didn't actually own their land, so they were paying a tax. But you know that even during the land grants, several times, this, I don't remember the exact name, I apologize, what colony it was, the governor of the colony who owned the land grant, so he owned the land, raised the tax for the property to a dollar, no it wasn't, he raised it a penny per hundred acres that you worked. And the town, the people that worked the land, I'm just using this as an example, raising it one penny per hundred acres, revolted, went to his house with the pitchforks, and burned his house to the ground. And that happened over and over and over and over. You see where they didn't put up with, and again, they didn't own the land. They were renting the land, but they had an agreement with the landowner, who was the governor. This is what your pay will be. And whenever they broke that, or just arbitrarily raised it, they had a barn raising, except it went down instead of up. A lot of times they didn't necessarily burn the house down, but they there's more than one instance, several times, where they ran the governors out of the country. And they owned the land. And they said, no, you won't treat us this way. We have natural rights as British subjects. We have the natural rights of men. So that's kind of the background of where we're coming from, with the British all of a sudden deciding they're going to tax the... English colonies, or the American colonies. They were English colonies, actually. They started out with the Stamp Act, which basically anything that you did that was um, official had to have a stamp, a piece of paper with an official stamp on it, saying that you paid a tax. That's all it was. It was just the permission to do something. It was a license. It was a permit. It was anything like what we don't even think about when we buy now from our government, our permission to do whatever, to drive, to hunt, to fish, to have a business, to do business, to get a job. Same thing. The Stamp Acts did not last very long because the colonists of America sufficiently decided we will not obey the Stamp Act. They burnt the stamps down. They would burn the warehouses down that held the stamps. Most of the times, the stamp collectors who sold the stamps had to live on a ship off the coast of the colonies because they could not let their face be shown on the land of the colonists because they would get tarred and feathered, which was something I don't necessarily is a good thing to do, but it was an effective thing to do because eventually the parliament got rid of the Stamp Acts because they made no money off of it. In fact, they lost money. They, were, they had literal warehouses full of stamps that ended up just not being used. People just refused, which is what I think is the most important thing that Americans today need to do, is refuse to consent to their laws. They refused to consent to the Stamp Act, and they went about on their daily lives and did their, fair, did their trade and did their business anyways, because they said that they were free men and had British rights, and no one could change that, no arbitrary law.
part of that was the T Act, which I think it was uh, the Indi yeah West India Company owned was the favorite of the Parliament at the time, and they were the ones that you had you were forced to buy their tea in Boston. You couldn't. There was no free trade there. You were forced to buy their tea, and Britain put a hundred percent tax on their tea, and they said buy it. Which is actually where Americans' love for coffee came from. Because that's literally what happened was the English, American colonists quit drinking tea and chose this new bean called coffee. Which is kind of interesting how those things happen. So we can thank the tax for coffee, I guess. The, uh, the radical, well, I like to call him a radical and I don't mean it in a disparaging way, Samuel Adams. He was a radical for liberty and freedom, which is what we need to make things change is what we're going to have to be, as radicals, in our thoughts and our deliveries. The radical Samuel Adams, who was really, I think, I've heard him call this before, but I believe it also, the, well, the father of the American Revolution, one of my heroes, except for later in his life, I don't know, everyone makes mistakes, but this guy was right on the money. And he had what he had, what he called the Sons of Liberty, and they didn't put up with anything. He did not mess with these guys. They decided one time we're not going to we're not only not going to pay this tea act we're it's such an affront on our liberties to have these ships carrying this tea into our harbor i mean that's how passionate these people were it wasn't just the fact that they were forced to do it they were offended that the ship was even in their harbor how dare you even do this to us so they put on the mohawk deals and we all know that story they went and they dumped the tea now that was a private company they didn't feel, and these people, I mean, there's kind of a argument I've had with several libertarian folks that say, well, that was private property. They shouldn't have done that. And I can see that because it was private property. It was owned by the East India Company, but they were a government monopoly, so I don't really feel bad about it. I'm glad they did it. Well, the Boston Tea Party basically started the war. The parliament decided we've had enough of these idiots in the American colonies. Who do they think they are? King George is the divine right of God, by divine right of God, said they have to pay this tax, this tea tax. Who do they think they are? We're going to clamp down on them. They wouldn't pay our stamp tax. They don't want to pay for anything that British decides that they need to pay. That's pretty cool right there, actually. Just had to look. But so they put the clamps down. They said you are going to pay, and they came up with what Parliament called the Coercive Acts, or as Samuel Adams called the Intolerable Acts. One of those things was that they changed Massachusetts Constitution. Massachusetts had one of the oldest constitutions in the American colonies. It was a Puritan constitution, but it was their constitution. It was a localized constitution that everyone agreed to at the time. And Britain came in and said no more. We set up our new constitution here. No longer will you directly vote for the people that you have in your parliament. And those people won't vote for who's above you. And you will no longer have the right to vote for your governor. The king made General Gage, who was the occupying uh, general of the American colonies at the time, governor of Massachusetts. This outraged Massachusetts. They also closed the Boston Harbor and said until the people of Boston paid for the tea from the East Indian Company, they wouldn't allow any trade to go in and out. Well, if you are in a harbor town and your harbor isn't usable, you're going you're gonna to hurt. But something I think is interesting that John Adams looked at, John Adams was kind of a mediocre conservative. He's like a Republican, right? He's a mediocre kind of guy. And once, once the... Uh, once they closed the Boston Harbor, John Adams had a totally different outlook on it. John Adams was Samuel Adams' um, cousin. Samuel Adams was a radical. John Adams was kind of like a liberal Republican guy. So he goes, he was so outraged by this, he said, how can this be? He said, this is so against, Adams is also a lawyer, so he was very much into the common law and the law at the time. If you remember, he actually defended during the Boston Massacre, very unpopular of him, but he was so convicted for the rule of law, he defended the um, 
the British soldiers that shot the Bostonians during the massacre and got them off on a trial by jury. And it's really interesting for Americans at the time, especially, it was like, you're what kind of traitor are you? Are you a Democrat, Republican? Or? And it ends up being, but that's how much he, he believed in the rule of law and, the, and mostly the right to trial by jury, which we should all hold very dear to our hearts. It's the, I think, I'm getting off on a tangent, sorry. So, closing the Boston, Tea, Boston Harbor brought John Adams over to the radical side. Now we have John Adams saying, we are going to secede from Britain. We no longer need to be part of Britain. We need to be a free and independent state, which Samuel Adams is already calling for, and also um, Patrick Henry was one in Virginia. You have two different factions that were the most important factions in the American Revolution, which was the colony of Massachusetts, for liberty anyways, the colony of Massachusetts and the colony of Virginia. Those two were the most radical of the colonies, all 13 of them. They wanted independence. Virginia had the oldest constitution in the colonies, setting it up in 1607. And they were the first ones to have a Bill of Rights for their people. And they, they held those very dear. It wasn't just a piece of paper. It meant something. And no one had the right to abridge that. I guess, what do you say? One of the things that Sam, or, uh, sorry, one of the things that Patrick Henry said about the uh, course of acts when they changed Massachusetts co Constitution, he denounced the British government for attacking Boston like that, and he said that the British government has destroyed the ancient, con the ancient constitutions of our fathers, the constitutions and charters of the many colonies. And that's where... I should have said that a little earlier, but that's where it came about. Virginia's colony, colony had one of the oldest constitutions. And he was very upset because he just said, his whole thing was, you're destroying our charters. You're a foreign entity. Who are you, king, to tell us how we have to live? This is a really radical idea at the time. Today we take it for granted a little bit. But then, that was radical. The king was your sovereign. He was, to many of those people, he was God's voice, unfortunately. We also had, I was jumping around here, ended the course of acts, the intolerable acts, ended the right to trial by jury. The governor, or General Gage, could now suspend habeas corpus and suspend the right to trial by jury. And instead of having... So you, the historical thing of the trial by jury is all the way back to the Magna Charta of 1215. These were rights guaranteed by man. And now all of a sudden, this king and his parliament is saying, nah, you don't have that anymore. Arbitrarily, gone. So what they're doing now, it's part of the thing with the right to trial by jury is you get tried in front of your peers in the area that it happened. You know, one of the things with the Schaefer-Cox deal and everyone, you know, you can have an opinion on this way or that way or whatever. He wasn't tried by his peers in the area that he was, in the area that he was supposedly committed a crime. That's no different than the course of acts of 1774, when they decided that no longer do you have the right to trial by jury by your peers. They would start hauling people off to an admiralty court, no longer a common law court, an admiralty court in Nova Scotia, and they would get you convicted. One of the things that happened with the, uh, the Stamp Acts is that no, the, the, the British would bring these people in and try them, but the juries would never convict, which is the greatest thing about the jury. Don't convict. Just say no. They could never, the British government could never get a conviction from the colonists, unless it was something like, you know, murder or actual crimes, but just crimes against the state, no way. It didn't happen. So that's how they took care of it. They supposedly took the right away. They also had the Quartering Act, which we all know where you can't quarter. They said that they could quarter. If you didn't give the British Army enough money or whatever, they could just steal your private property and live in it. And the Quebec Act. This was interesting. It might not mean anything to us, but it has a lot of significance to the start of the Revolutionary War. The Quebec Act, after the Seven Years' War with... Uh, the French, well now England owned Quebec, which is Canada. That was called Canada then, but it's just the city of Quebec now. They owned that. Well, it was full of French people. 
what do you do with those guys? Well, they're also Catholics. And if we know, if we remember, the British were either Puritans in the north, and then they had the Anglicans, which was the state church in most of the southern colonies, and they hated Catholics. Catholics were not looked good on. And part of it is because of the wars with the popes and all that. The hundreds of years of wars, that's a whole other talk to really fully understand why there's this divide between the Catholics and the Protestants. But the King of England granted the Quebec Frenchmen civil liberties. He let them have the right of religion. They got to, they got to practice their own religion, which actually absolutely decimated the colonists. They said, wait a minute, you're forcing us Puritans to pay for your Anglican church, but you're not forcing the French Catholics to do the same thing? That's wrong. He also gave them autonomy to have their own laws and all this stuff that you should have, but he was restricting it from the English his own English American colonies. So that pissed them off. They wanted, it's one of the funny things about the war is that when we, we, the American colonists went to the French in Quebec and asked them to join us in the war for independence. They said, hey, you guys can be free. And they said, yeah, we are free. Not going to fall for it. Because one of the things like John Jay was saying at the time was every time he wrote something, he would call it the Protestant colonies, the Protestant states of America. So they kind of gave their position away with the Catholics. And, eh, whatever. We let the French have it. First Continental Congress got together to petition the king in 1774. Samuel Adams was the one that asked for a Continental Congress to get together. He said, people, we need relief. You have to help us. They were starving the Boston, city of Boston out. Literally starving them out. People had no jobs. They had no work. The farmers couldn't bring their crops in, their wheat or anything to feed, to sell. It was a bad situation. Congress at the time had moderates in their for the majority. Only Massachusetts and Virginia sent the radicals. The rest of them were just a bunch of Republicans. And if you doubt me, that's what they were. They were conservatives. At the time, it was what the conservative party was. They were the Republicans of the time. I'm not making it up. So the moderates had the day. They decided we're not going to go for... Rev there, we already have a war, I should say. The war started April 19, 1774 at Lexington, Concord. So the Continental Congress gets together to talk these things over and they beg the king, they petition the king, intervene, stop this war. The king turned around and instead of stopping the war, set out what he called the, well, what was called the Royal Proclamation. The king made proclamations all the time. This was called the Royal Proclamation to the colonies. Because he said, not only am I not going to intervene, any of you fighting against me are traitors. And you will be treated as traitors. That's actually when the Royal Proclamation came back to the States is when um, Benjamin Franklin said the famous, gentlemen, we, we have to stop. We all should, we're all going to, we all must hang together. We shall all hang separately. And that was why. They were all called traitors now from the King of England. And that meant drawn and quartered, burn your guts out, hang it by the head. Not a pretty thing. So the Battle of Lexington, we all know, I think we all know. Gage goes out to find Samuel Adams and mm, Hamilton. No, I hate Hamilton. Oh, one of those guys. Hancock. Thank you. Samuel Adams and John Hancock were supposedly supposed to be at Concord, and just down the road was the the colony of Massachusetts store of arms. So Gage decided to go get it. We all know that the colonists, the militia, stopped them and wouldn't allow them to cross the bridge into Concord. And that's where we had the shot heard around the world. No one knows who really happened, but we do know that American colonists were killed and there were no British colonists. British soldiers heard at the time. They went on and marched on to um, Lexington and met a surprise there. The people from all around heard what happened in Concord and came in with their arms and put a stop to them. Now on their march back to Boston, 
they had on their march back to Boston the word went out to all the colonies what had happened and you had the militias who were just men grab their knapsack grab an apple grab their rifle and they went and they fought the British all the way back to Boston all the way back to the city of Boston they just did pop shots they didn't confront them it would have been foolish this is the most powerful army in the world they just defeated the French armies and the Spanish armies at the same time but they kicked their butt all the way back to Boston and now Gage found out he's not the governor of Massachusetts anymore he's the governor of Boston only because all of Boston was surrounded by militia which eventually did disperse and this and that so we have a war everyone fights George Washington was put in head of the uh, supreme commander of the the Continental Army I am going to say a couple things what I think about the Continental Army and putting Washington and I think it's the correct view is that Washington I think was a great man in several instances but he had no business being the general of the Continental Army Washington wanted to have a army like the rest of the world this was not an army like the rest of the world this was a revolutionary army this was an army of militia this was an army of the people and Washington did a great disservice to the revolution when he tried to make the Continental Army an army, a European army, making them wear their, their uh, uniforms, making them do their marches, making them do all sorts of things that they didn't want to do. Another difference between the Continental Army and a militia was that the militias would vote their own leadership. You stood around, you had a hundred people there, you said, all right, who's going to lead us into this one? Eh, pick Joe. So they picked Joe, they went to war. The Continental Army said, this is your leader. You will obey him. So the what I feel like the Continental Army did was it took away the basis of the Revolutionary War, which is the natural rights and freedom, and conscripted them in a way and forced them to fight a certain way that they really shouldn't have. It took away the freedom and the... I don't know what the right word is. It just it took away the act, the very essence of what the revolution was about. We're about freedom. We're about doing as we please. Not this Continental Army. And if you look, the Continental Army got its butt handed to them over and over and over and over and over. Because they wanted to have glory. They wanted to be like the big guys over in Europe. So they wanted to go meet in the battlefield. You can't beat Britain in the battlefield. They were professional soldiers. We did, the Americans did win the revolution eventually. There were a few Continental Army victories, greatly helped by the French, especially their Navy. But the uh, British campaign in the South was fought completely by Southern militias. No organized army at all, none. People would come together, gather together, fight, and they literally would go back home, milk their cows, kiss their wife, go to bed, get up, do their chores, and run back to the war. That's a militia. And that's what wins in a revolution. And that's what did win. The whole southern campaign by the British and some of the Britain's top generals, their whole navy went to the south. They sent two separate armies into the south to conquer the south because they thought if we can cut off the food supply and all this from the south and get rid of the markets going back and forth in the north and south, we have it made. We'll choke the north to surrender. They couldn't beat the south. And it was because people fighting in South Carolina had people in Virginia and North Carolina and all around swarming down to volunteer to take a shot. And they never met head on. It was one of the greatest tricks, and I wish I could remember the guy's name, some of the greater militia generals. They would meet the British on the field, shoot or not shoot, turn and run as fast as they could go. They would run a mile, the British would chase them like that. Eh. We kick their butt again. They'd come around the corner, there'd be another line. They'd shoot, they'd turn, and they'd run. And they would chase them for a hundred miles. Well, now they're without any logistics because they weren't thinking. They're just thinking, oh, we're going to catch them, we're going to catch them. And then the militia would turn around and fall on them and destroy them. They utterly destroyed the British Army in the South. And I think it's, uh, I think it says a lot to. The difference between a coercive 
the course of Continental Army and a free army of people that are fighting for their own rights, that are fighting for their freedoms, their literal freedoms. They were fighting because they wanted their kids to be free. They weren't fighting for the state. They weren't fighting for these leaders. These men were fighting for their families. And that's the difference in a revolution between victory and defeat. And ultimately, of course, the uh, people had victory. Common sense, one of the things I was going to say is that uh, in the beginning, Samuel Adams and his Sons of Liberty fought the revolution before the actual firing started in the best way possible with a war of words. A, pan, a pamphlet campaign went out, a newspaper campaign went out, all these campaigns started and it was all a war of words. It had nothing to do with shooting or killing or coercion, it was I am going to win the hearts and minds of the people and once I win the hearts and minds of the people we'll win this war. John Adams said that the revolution was won way before the first shot was fired. It was won when the people's hearts and minds changed from being servants of the king to lovers of liberty. Once that happened, the war is over. It was quite over. We didn't even have to fight. They could have waited the British out. Maybe it would take 20 years, but eventually the British would have had to have gone because they, gave, they took away their consent from the British government and said, we will no longer give you our consent to rule us. And it was the people as a whole. that. War would have never been fought if the, or won if the people as a whole hadn't supported it. And there was some Tories and all that, you know, Republicans and stuff that were against it. But for the most part, the people were for the people. It was a people's war, and they won. I don't want to use, bring up bad juju or whatever, but look at the insurgents in Iraq. That's kind of like the same way it was. Britain looked at our people as terrorists. Our founding fathers as terrorists, the militia fighters as terrorists, insurgents. But it's a very capable way of fighting a war, which we have unfortunately had to find out in Afghanistan and Iraq. We don't learn very well. Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. Vietnam's a great example of that. Ah, Swamp Fox, Swamp Fox, where have you been? I used to watch that all the time as a kid. Nathaniel Green is Green Mountain Boys. I, I had a bunch of stuff on my phone for references, and it's gone, so I'm kind of... Common Sense, written by Thomas Paine, was the most read and publicized book ever in American history, especially according to population. Up to 500,000 copies of Thomas Paine's Common Sense were published in the United States colony, in little you, United States colonies, the, the colonies of the states. There was approximately 2.5 million people in the colonies at the time, and he sold 500,000 copies of his pamphlet. You have to figure that was men, women, children. So there's always two, well back then, shoot, there's probably eight kids per family, so there's only like 50 adults in the whole thing, and he still sold 500,000 copies. It's been said, or theorized, that every man, woman, and child either read or heard Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And that was the turn of the tide when America was able to stand up and say, we should be free. That turned the whole tide, which brings me to the Declaration of Independence. I kind of got done with the war, sort of. Yes? Pardon? Who? I was homeschooled too. Otherwise, I wouldn't know any of this stuff, probably. So, with common sense, we have the Second Continental Congress. The people are ready to secede from the king, they're ready to be free. And remember, this was a war of natural rights and liberties. This wasn't just a war for a new governor, a new king. This wasn't a war for, well, who are we going to have rule us now? This was a war for their freedom. 
This is a war for their natural rights of men. Just real quick, I would like to bring up that this was the hardest thing that these British subjects ever did was to break from England. It was a good thing to be a British citizen. It wasn't, we're kind of, we kind of have the adage now that, oh yeah, they were so terrible and it was so horrible, they finally broke the chains and that's not true. That's how much liberty meant to these people. They had it good. They traded with the world. They had some of the best land in the world for their crops. They had literal to zero taxes. And they loved their king. It sounds weird, but they loved the British, the British monarchy because their families, they were British subjects. They were British people. They loved the... If you think about now, how we would feel of just... Well, I don't know if that's a good one. To break from America as an American... If you think about it, especially tradition was so much more deeper back then. To break from the British government was really hard on them because it was their motherland. They loved it. They were breaking from their own relatives in England. But they begged those relatives, help us. Get the king's attention. We need help. We're being destroyed over here. So it wasn't an easy thing. As I think that we lose that now. But liberty and the natural rights of man were so important to these people. It was more important than their families abroad. It was more important than their servitude to the king. It was more important than their homeland. So they knew what the next step was to do, and that was to declare independence. We already had Congress, the Second Continental Congress, already passed a resolution to be independent states. Then there was a committee of five that were put together. Thomas Jefferson was the lead pen on it, pulling from the wisdom of John Locke, Algernon Sidney, the Cato Letters, and many others, wrote the infamous document that declared, that declared history. Well, I'm, when I read this first part here, I want you guys just to imagine in your mind, nothing like this had ever happened before in the history of the world. Never. The thought of it hadn't even crossed people's minds up until recent times at this point. It wasn't even something you could conceive in your mind. When the course of human events becomes necessary for one people to dissolve political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and God's and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. This was the declaration also to the world, telling the world why we we're separating. I need to make a point about that. One of the reasons is the rest of the world still has kings. And if you want these other kings to recognize your new colonies, your new states, you need to give them a really good reason why they should, because they have colonies all over the world too. And this is going to shock the world. And this is actually what led to the French Revolution right here, too. Not to mention the Bahamas revolted. All over the world we had revolts because of this Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created, and this is the most important part, all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. When any, whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, or not, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall be seen the most likely to affect, most likely to affect their safety and happiness. What were these liberties? Saint Thomas Jefferson also the word liberty when they said they had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of liberty, I would say that, this is a Thomas Jefferson quote, and the whole plenitude of, it ex of its extent, it's an unobstructed action according to our will. Rightful liberty is an unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn by the others, equal rights of others. I do not add within the limits of the law, because the law is but the will tyrant's will, and also, and always so when it violates the rights of an individual. So the Declaration of Independence we have, 
stating that all men are created equal and have rights, unalienable rights, that cannot be taken by anybody. No one has the right to take away your rights. Nothing that you shouldn't do should be done by government. I think that's one of the things that we miss now so much with the institutions of government is that we think, well, I can't do that. The government has the right to. That's dead wrong. If you can't do that because it's wrong for you, it's wrong for government. Because what is government? It's mere men. Mere men that we foolishly put in to rule over us, in my opinion. So, governments have no right beyond what your rights are. Governments are instituted strictly and only to protect those rights. And any time like today, I mean, there's... We could spend years talking about we could draw up a con we could go over the Declaration of Independence and check mark all the way down the same abuses that this government does to us. I don't think that we should have an armed revolution because I don't think it would be a good thing. Especially because right now we don't have the hearts and minds of the people. We fight ourselves over and over and over little stupid things that really don't matter. We don't stand up for each other's rights. We look at, I'm gonna use some examples here, Occupy Wall Street or Fairbanks or whatever, they were wrong in their, in most of their precepts, most of their ideas, they were wrong, okay? They were a lot of socialists and this and that. The people, the other side of it, they were wrong for not supporting them. We should have, everyone, supported the Occupy people because they were protesting wrongdoings. Now, what they wanted to come out of it may not have been good, but what they were there doing, protesting, we should have been, all of us, supporting that protest because that protest is our right to protest. And today we see other things where we criticize, well, look, Thomas Jefferson said, What country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that this people preserve the spirit of resistance? The government has to be reminded that we have that with us. If we don't remind them, if we just sit back and lallygag all the time, they've defeated us. And I think right now we can say that the government has won and defeated the people per se. But as long as there is a spirit of liberty, as long as there are two people willing to talk about it, then it can turn around. I don't know what all the answers are for it, but I know that supporting what's going on in our government right now is wrong. I think our, the best effect that we can have is to remove our support from them and do what the colonists did. They paved the way for us. We could do the same thing today. I don't know how long it'll take but our time preference can't be tomorrow because that's that's the enemy's way. They want satisfaction now, and that's what they do. We want to win. That may take another 100 years. That might take 200 years. But that doesn't negate our responsibility to fight for it every day, no matter what. We might be the outcasts. People call us the radicals. Wear that hat with pride. Darn right I'm a radical. I'm a radical for liberty. There's nothing wrong with that. So every, America, every American in America should be a radical for liberty. Oh, well, I guess I'm pretty much done. I'd just like to encourage everyone to learn history. I think it's very important to know our history. To not only so we don't repeat the bad things, but we have a maybe a road map to what good things we could use in the future. Not everything the Founding Fathers did was correct. I could go on for days on things I think they did wrong. But they did pretty good for what they had at the time. We need to be, in my mind, the progressives. The real progressives are people that are advancing liberty. We should be progressing liberty every day of our lives with our fellow man. We should be standing up for our fellow man. So I just encourage people to get to know your neighbors, get to know your friends better. Get to know your friends better. That's a pretty good start. And whenever you see resistance to tyranny, support it, no matter who it is. I mean, look at Shays' Rebellion. The uh, Shays' Rebellion was after the revolution. The uh, colonists at the time that were um, 
ex-Continental soldiers were fighting the government of Massachusetts for putting up taxation without representation. The same thing all over again. And when uh, Thomas Jefferson was asked about that, and they said, well, look at these crazies. He said, no. I want there to be turmoil against the government all the time. We need the government to be put in check all the time. He's the one that said, if we don't have a revolution every 20 years, we got trouble. And guess what that revolution would have been against? His own constitution. He knew you can't have this stuff be eternal, time and immoral, immoral or whatever. Things change, but our rights and liberties never do. So I hope that whenever you guys see somebody, see the news or whatever, don't look down on the people that are protesting, even if they're not of your political persuasion. Hopefully your political persuasions go out and your love for liberty goes in. Support them and remind people to support them. If you hear people downplaying just the minor person that's fighting for their rights, educate them. I still think that we can make a change, maybe if not for the nation, the nation might be too big to change. I don't know. I have the best intent. I hope for the best for the whole country, but I don't know what the whole country is going to do. But I'm more worried about where I live in Fairbanks and the local communities around it than I have to be with the rest of the country. Because I can't affect the change necessarily in D.C., but we can all affect change with our neighbors. And at the same time, we need to be vigilant with D.C. because they do affect our very lives every day. So, anyways, thanks for letting me talk. I guess I'm done. <laughs>